Rise of Civilization. This is an introduction to ancient Egypt. So here you see pictures of the cartouches that I was talking about. So again, usually it was the names of pharaohs in hieroglyphics, but if you go there, you can get your own name in hieroglyphics. <coughs> so the big thing is, how were we able to translate hieroglyphics? What you need to understand is in the 1700s, um, when Europe started becoming interested in all things Egypt and up to the early 1800s, no one could read hieroglyphics. So it wasn't until the Rosetta Stone was found that we were able to decipher hieroglyphics. Coincidence that the language program is called Rosetta Stone? So basically, um, in 1822, a Frenchman by the name of Champollion used, uh, found a rock, and on it, it had hieroglyphics, it had an ancient form of hieroglyphics, but then it had Greek. And because we knew how to read Greek, that's how the code was cracked. So this was a really important milestone. Ancient Egypt had a highly stratified society. So you had the pharaohs, which were like the kings or presidents, viziers like governors, nomarchs like mayors, priests, scribes, craftsmen, and then obviously peasants. Every society has them. And there's also a lot of um, art with dwarfs, which is kind of interesting. So here's kind of another way of looking at Egyptian social hierarchy. And here are some famous Egyptian pharaohs. Lucky for you, I'm not a date person. Here are some depictions of Egyptian nobility. The priestly caste or class the scribes. And the paper that they used is called papyrus. It was made from a reed. So it's kind of like our homemade paper now, if you ever see any of that. So whenever you hear about ancient Egyptian papyri or papyrus, that's what it's referring to. Guess what? If you're a beer drinker, as far as we can tell, beer originated in ancient Egypt. So the Egyptians were really big on bread, beer, garlic, onions, lettuce. This is supposedly the oldest bread that's ever been found. Looks like something from your refrigerator when you come back from vacation. And then again, is there a reason why we have like pyramid ale? Because the Egyptians kind of came up with beer. And here are some pictures on how they made beer. They also had wine. So Egyptians, we know, danced, had parties. And the, the kind of interesting thing is that some of the earliest hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics we find has erotic poetry on it. So I'm going to read you a poem. And it's called Love, How I'd Love to Sit Down by the Pond. Now, don't forget, Memphis is ancient Cairo. So it goes, Love, how I'd love to slip down to the pond. Bathe with you close by on the bank. Just for you, I'd wear my new Memphis swimsuit, made of sure linens, fit for a queen. Come see how it looks in the water. Couldn't I coax you in to wade with me? Let the cool creep slowly around us. Then I dive deep down and come up for you dripping. Let you fill your eyes with the little red fish I'd catch. And I'd say, as I stroked my fish and it tended to get bigger, look at my fish, love. Look how it lies in my hand, how my fingers caress it, slip down on its sides. But then I'd say softer, eyes bright with your seeing, a gift love, no words, come closer, look, it's all me. Whoa, that's pretty hot stuff for ancient Egypt. 
Okay, Egyptian beauty. Women loved makeup. We know that both men and women wore makeup. Coal eyeliner. That originated in ancient Egypt. They would wear rouge. Um, and wigs were worn bo by both men and women. Probably because it was really hot. And I found this slide from a UCLA class that said the ladies were shaved entirely, sometimes even their heads, which made sense if they wore wigs. And to emphasize this, their pleated skirts were worn wide open in front. Pretty racy. So mummification. I'm going to just go through this really fast. Very ancient art. So early mummification, the bodies were just put in the ground and or left outside. It was so hot they naturally mummified. Later, the ancient Egyptians began burying their dead in coffins. I know this is coming is not coming out very well, but I'm just going to proceed. And little by little, we had the mummification process taking place. So how did they do it? The Egyptians wanted to look their best in the afterlife, and that's kind of how mummification began. So these pictures are actually from John Hopkins University. Um, doctors tried to recreate an ancient Egyptian mummification on a body. So the first thing they did was take out the brain. And you can see here that they used kind of a hook similar to what we would call a crochet hook, for lack of a better word. And they would actually pull parts of the brain through the nostrils. And then they made a dissection. Um, actually, when uh, doctors now do autopsies, they do what's called a Y incision and based on what the Egyptians did. So they actually, in, in Egypt, they took out the abdomen, um, all the organs except one. And they put the organs in what were called canopic jars. And so the organs did not go in the body. They stayed in these canopic jars, which usually represented um, the Egyptian gods and goddesses. And then natron was used to dry the body. The only place it's found is in Egypt, kind of a, a mixture between um, mineral salt and bicarbonate. And small packets were stuffed inside the cavity. cavity. In this particular mummification, it took 400 pounds from Egypt to um, dry out the body. And then um, what they would do is they would anoint the body with frankincense and myrrh. And then they'd wrap the body in linen. Uh, a small amulet was then placed over the only organ left inside the body, which was the heart. So the Egyptians um, thought the heart was the most important organ. And then there would be final um, prayers. There you're seeing the jackal god named Anubis, who is the god of embalming. So he would say, you are young again, you live again, and off you go into the afterlife. Um, because they wanted the bodies perfect in the afterlife, this is actually a picture of a mummy that they found with a prosthetic toe. So in life, the toe had been amputated, so they actually made a toe out of leather for the mummy. And then they would have the journey to the afterlife. And the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which you could still get in any bookstore, would be a guide. It would tell you what you needed to do on your journey to the afterlife. And then you'd have the final judgment, which we'll talk about. So you can see here, it's hard to see, but the heart is being weighed against a feather. And they actually found a lot of these Shabbatis. These were the Pharaoh's servants that were sent with him into the afterlife. A lot of mummies have been were, were taken from ancient Egypt. They were just grave robbed. This one uh, was a famous pharaoh, ended up in an Atlanta sideshow. Here's some other celebrity mummies.
You could just look at these. Uh, what I find really interesting is animals were also mummified. So in the case of kitties, they would actually give them a bowl and a chair to scratch in the afterlife, but not just cats were mummified or animals as well. Here again is an article that they did on pets of the pharaohs. And a lot of times these animals received elaborate burials. Here's some more animal mummies. There used to be a program um, where you could adopt an, an, an Egyptian animal mummy, which meant that if you had $100 you didn't know what to do with, you would send it over there and that would give them the money to x-ray the mummy. You wouldn't get the mummy, but you'd get the x-ray, which would be kind of cool. And here's some more um, stuff about cats. I'm putting a video on for you to watch about the Egyptian cats. <laughs> 